we didn't include the nursing notes in our technology because we just didn't see the value. What could a nurse tell us that a physician couldn't? Oh, nurses are implementers, not innovators. Hmm. These are just a few of the types of things that were recently said to me by a technologist, building a platform that will drive the future of artificial intelligence in healthcare. And the thing about this type of technology is the way it gets built matters. The way it gets built determines not only how it answers questions, like whether or not it can draw on information in the nursing notes in order to make its calculations, but also what types of questions get answered in the first place, whose those questions are, and therefore who the technology ultimately helps or harms. And as has so often been the case, the people building this technology saw nurses only as the end users. They didn't understand how we could help them build a better system right from the very beginning. And this is just one of many types of conversations like this that I have had in recent years. Conversations where I am the only nurse at the table. Tables full of scientists and technologists and people from industry, but tables where nurses have not been invited. And often, I haven't been invited either. So I bring my own chair. And as a nurse inventor who co-creates technology with patients and caregivers and collaborators from many different types of disciplines, I know that when I'm at the table, it is not my job to have all the answers. Rather, one of the most important things I can do is to ask questions, nursing questions, and to listen deeply to the answers. Questions like, what does health really look like for you? What roles and activities are most important to you, and how does that shape how you see yourself in the world? What are your strengths, and how can we build on those? And how can we change, not you, but the environment around you to better support you? And perhaps most importantly, do we even understand the challenge that we should be designing for in the first place, and who else should be here to help us understand that? My experiences as a nurse informs these questions, and by asking nursing questions, we introduce what is so often missing from what I call the armchair design processes, the voices and experiences and values of our patients. By asking nursing questions, we bring dignity to the design process, and by asking nursing questions, we challenge outdated assumptions about the role of the nurse as strictly a provider of personalized care to include provider of strategic insights. Far too often, nurses have been regarded as implementers of other people's solutions, and it is our job to help the world understand that we are also problem solvers and groundbreaking innovators. In the rush to bring forward new types of technology, other innovators often miss critical details about healing and health, vital aspects of human dignity that nurses understand better than anyone else. Details like the environment. How does the nature of where a person lives support or prevent healing and health? The context. What's going on in this person's life? What do they hope for? And what keeps them up at night? The support. What is this person's community? Who is showing up for them? And how do social determinants like institutionalized racism or the criminalization of being poor or being trans affect a person's health and well-being? The answers to these questions paint the story that is the life of our patient, and our nursing notes may be the only place in the health record where that story is recorded. So. When you think of the term inventor, what comes to mind? Do you see a nurse? Do you see yourself? I can show you what Google sees. I Googled famous inventors, and here's what I got. And looking at this image alone, hmm, one might conclude that critical attributes associated with being an inventor include being white, male, and mostly dead. <laughs> 
One might also falsely conclude that inventors are like these solitary geniuses, laboring alone in their labs until one night they hit their heads and cry, Eureka, and then start wearing like black turtlenecks or something. <laughs> And, and the answer could not be further from the truth. As a nurse inventor, I know nothing I do would be possible without a team, and everything our team has invented has been driven by the opportunities and challenges shared with us by our patients. Inventions like a toolkit to support wellness among breast cancer survivors. We have worked with many different types of people who've had breast cancer, who've had difficulty accessing services designed specifically for them including men with breast cancer, and also people living in isolated areas, such as the hill towns of Western Massachusetts and Puerto Rico. And we wanted to create something that would actually help to support people reach their goals, goals like staying active, managing sleep and energy, and also more intimate challenges, like maintaining sexual well-being and pleasure after cancer therapy. I don't know about you all, but I have never seen the term pleasure pop up in the electronic health record as an option. But this work is not about doing what the system tells us to do. It's about listening and actually responding to our patients. And people, especially women, also told us about experiences of feeling gaslighted because of invisible symptoms like fatigue. Do you all know what the term gaslighting means? It's like where you have a very real distressing experience and someone tells you it's just all in your head. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we partnered with computer scientists and neuroscientists to evaluate how a type of eye tracking technology that measures the movements of your eyes could actually capture the very real functional impacts of invisible symptoms like fatigue. And the purpose of this invention was not to prove who really has fatigue and who doesn't, but rather to make invisible aspects of these symptoms visible in ways that would allow our patients to be heard and to be believed. And these days, more and more care is happening at home, including taking chemotherapy. And people taking chemotherapy at home, some of them told us about their fears of exposing loved ones to toxic byproducts of these drugs as they left their systems. And this fear, it can lead people to stop doing some of the things that are most important to them in life, like caregiving and breastfeeding and sharing beds and bathrooms and even having sex with their partners. And this fear, whether it's grounded in evidence or not, it's very real. So we partnered with chemical engineers to start developing new microfluidic technology, also known as lab-on-a-chip devices, like a pregnancy test, that would allow people to understand when these drugs had fully exited their systems so that they could get back to the things that were most important to them in life. And also so that clinicians and scientists like me could design better, fairer, evidence-based precaution guidelines for home chemotherapy. And then, and then there was an invention that took us in an entirely new direction. Last year, we started developing a solution to a problem I had encountered nearly a decade earlier in the midst of a disaster. In 2010, I volunteered to serve as a triage nurse for the main emergency room tent of the academic hospital in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, after an earthquake had devastated most of the country. And until you've been in those types of disaster scenarios, you may not understand just how difficult it can be to access critically needed medical supplies like IV fluids. I mean, a bag of IV fluids seems simple enough, right? But they're heavy and they're vulnerable to puncture and that makes them difficult to transport in emergencies. However, a single bag of saline can mean the difference between life and death. And we ran out. And we nurses were left in the position of asking, who gets the last bag? And those experiences, and particularly the ingenuity and heroism of the Haitian nurses and medical staff and community who persisted through and beyond that tragedy, they've stuck with me. Their faces, their stories, I carry them with me. Have you ever carried someone you've cared for with you? 
And it also taught me that if your innovation doesn't work in a tent hospital or another resource-starved context, then you haven't really solved the problem. You've just solved it for some people. And then in 2017, Hurricane Maria struck the island of Puerto Rico, bringing with it loss of life and devastation, and also simultaneously wiping out most of the IV fluid manufacturing capacity for North America. And my friend and nurse colleague there in San Juan, she was texting me in the wake of the storm about limited supplies like saline and electricity and drinkable water, and my head went straight back to that tent hospital in Haiti. Why hadn't we solved this problem already? Didn't we have the technology? But this time, instead of just stuffing down my outrage and going on with my day, I was in a position to take action, starting with asking nursing questions. I happened to be in a room full of chemists and engineers, and I shared with them the texts from my Puerto Rican nurse colleagues who were the ones actually responding to the disaster and just wondered out loud, isn't there something we can do? Like, couldn't we develop some type of system that would allow you to purify water, not just for drinking, but to generate the types of IV fluids you need in a disaster? And this time the answer from the room was yes. And we put together a unicorn team, a sort of dream team of people who knew about water purification and IV fluid chemistry and engineering. And that very day we got to work sketching out the types of equipment you would need to build if you wanted to design a portable system to generate critically needed IV fluids in a disaster. And that's that, that's just what can happen when you are the only nurse in a room full of smart people with good intentions, but no idea how or where to start applying them. <laughs> Big things can happen. But I also want to say, we had no illusions. Like, we didn't think we were just going to magically invent this technology overnight and then swoop in from the outside and save the day, because it doesn't work like that. You know, the heroes in Hurricane Maria were the Puerto Rican nurses and nursing students and staff who helped their communities survive and begin to rebuild in the wake of that disaster. But we hoped that by learning from them, we could start to build technology that so in the future, when a similar disaster strikes, the nurses on the ground will be in a position to provide the best quality care. So. We're still far from a final product, but in partnership with a, another startup, we've begun work on a portable backpack-like system that would allow you to purify existing water sources, like tap or bottled water, to the degree that you would need for medical injection and then introduce that to empty IV fluid bags that already have the right amounts of salts and sugars, which are much easier to transport, they're lighter and more easily stored. And, So, I'm very proud of our nursing inventions, many of which involve technology, but I also want to say we are not just about building technology for technology's sake. This work is not about technology. It's about human dignity. Seeing people, listening to people, being in relationship to people, and designing the types of supports and solutions that allow people to do the things that are most important to them. So. I would like to share one last story, a story that takes us back to well before I was an inventor or a mom or even a nurse. As a kid, I wanted to be everything under the sun, including the impossible combination of the world's first nun slash nonviolent fighter pilot. <laughs> and to that end, <laughs> I got accepted into the United States Navy and the Peace Corps in the same week. <laughs> and I ended up joining the Peace Corps and moving to Mali, West Africa, which was a profoundly humbling and eye-opening experience, particularly in just beginning to learn the depths and the breadth of what I did not know about the world and all the assumptions I had made about what my role there would be. I went in thinking I was going to be a helper. 
And I ended up learning far more than I think I ended up helping. Learning from people who made their homes on the edge of the Sahara Desert in a place with no electricity, no running water, no internet, but such tremendous wealth in terms of community and human connection and the fact that you could roll into any village and know that you would have a place to stay and food to eat. And that actually happened to me on several occasions. And not just because I was an American, but because that was the culture there. And I spent most of my days with the midwives, some of whom had been formally trained, and others who just learned from the people who came before them, working in a concrete shelter with no technology and no doctors and no OR to back them up. And there's one day in particular I will never forget. A very young, very pregnant woman walked into the clinic, and as I turned to check her in, I noticed there was something hanging down between her legs that looked kind of like a rope. And as she got closer, I saw that wasn't a rope. That was an umbilical cord, which is a major medical emergency, even in a state-of-the-art hospital. And I did not have the nursing skills to care for her. I wasn't a nurse. I was just there to support the educational mission. So I called for the midwife, and she came running. And what she did next was nothing short of miraculous. And using her eyes and her ears and her hands, as she laid the woman down right where she was and began her assessment, she started manipulating the position of the baby, which was breech. And there was no way we were going to get to an OR. And even if we had, this woman likely would have risked dying of bleeding to death or in an infection. But as I watched my friend, the expert Malian midwife, delivered a baby. And then a few minutes later, she delivered a second baby. Twins! <laughs> and, and the next day, that new mother walked back out of the clinic, back to her village, her two new babies tied to her with a brightly colored piece of fabric. And, and what I want you to know is, the nurses and the midwives who work there may not have all had tons of certifications and fancy degrees next to their names, but make no mistake, they were the true experts. And they brought their relationship to the community and just this incredible capacity to be present and attuned to the needs of their patients. So as you can imagine, I was pretty stoked about becoming a nurse. Whew. So I came back to the United States, I trained as a nurse, and I went to work at Johns Hopkins Cancer Center, which is a very large, technologically advanced, award-winning hospital with many wonderful nurses and great nursing care. But now that I was a nurse, I found myself struggling to be present for my patients. And experiences of feeling like technologies, like endless click-through menus on the electronic health record and ceaseless alarms were actually robbing me of the ability to provide good nursing care instead of supporting that ability. Those experiences continue to inform the work I do today. So, you may be thinking, this is great! I am totally a nurse inventor, this is why I show up. Or you may be sitting there thinking, eh, that's cool and all, but I'm not a nurse inventor. I'm just trying to survive nursing school. I hear you. Yeah. That's real. <laughs> I will be present and I will listen to you. Um, but I want to challenge you to change the way you think about invention. I want to challenge you to think of yourself as a nurse inventor, even if you're still in the headspace of just trying to survive nursing school. Because your presence in the rooms you show up in already matters. And by building relationships with your patients and communities, and by asking nursing questions like, why not? And what's really going on here? And how can I better understand what this person is trying to tell me? You will gain new insights, and you will use your voice, and you will take up space as a nurse in the ways that your patients and communities and coworkers need you to. Sometimes the most radical, innovative thing we can do is to simply show up and be present 
and allow the person in front of us to be seen and to be heard and to be understood. And that is a power every single one of us has, no matter what rooms we hang out in. That is an act that can and must drive everything else. Without it, we are going to design systems that do not honor the people that we have trained so hard to support. Systems like electronic health records, which, just so you know, were originally designed as elaborate billing platforms, with things like nursing care all rolled into one line item called room and board that appeared in the bill. Think about it. We capture every other aspect of health care but nursing interactions at the bedside. And without that information, if we build our algorithms based on that, we are going to miss a huge part of the picture of the types of human interaction that actually drive healing and health. And artificial intelligence platforms that are driven largely from the data from those electronic health records, but that don't read the nursing notes because the people building them didn't see the value in them. The nursing note is one of the few places in the chart where a patient whose story cannot be simply and neatly summarized with check boxes and blood panels can actually be seen and where their voice can be heard. And if we miss that, while the output of a world that excludes that type of human messiness may look super clean, we are automating out of our system some of the information that is most vital to healing and health. So, the future of innovation in healthcare to be truly innovative and to achieve justice and equity for our patients must include our voices at every level of development and delivery and policy making. Presently, less than 5% of hospital boards have nursing representation at the highest level. And the recently replicated Woodhull study of nursing representation in the media showed, including newspapers and major health industry publications, that nurses were cited as expert sources less than 2% of the time. Less than 2%. I see a future where our voices and the voices of the patients and caregivers we co-design and collaborate with aren't just supporting innovation, they're driving it. I call myself a nurse, and a nurse scientist, and a nurse inventor. I call myself these things because I am these things. The truth is, all of us are nurse scientists, and all of us are nurse inventors. It's just what we do, whether or not we get the credit. Thank you. <laughs>